Hello everyone, welcome to Insight. We pick up from where we left off last week in our previous episode and bring you the concluding parts of our video in town hall. But this time we bring you the senior special assistant to the president on the social investment program. And of course, the national response plan on COVID-19 remains our focus. We will attempt to explore various aspects of the action plan. As usual, Elizabeth Omoru, Omoru is here with me. What's the outlook for the media review segment for this episode? Well, this week we shall be taking a look at fake news now that the world is grappling with the containment of COVID-19 and how will the PTF on COVID-19 in Nigeria handle fake news in order to remain focused on their agenda. That will be our focus on the media review segment. Uh, good. Let's just go forward and bring you the discussion segment. In our previous episode, we realized that most of your questions centered on the palliatives being, uh, being deployed by the federal government to mitigate the economic impact of um, the coronavirus pandemic here in Nigeria. We thought it wise to, to bring to our studio the senior special uh, assistant to the president on the social investment program, Barista Ismail Ahmed. Uh, welcome to Insight. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, let, let's take um, let's begin our conversation by asking you to speak to some element of the social investment program, mm -hmm. actually being criticised by by some in certain quarters, where it's, it's the situation where cash, physical cash, is being doled out to beneficiaries of um, uh, of certain element or component of the social investment program. Uh, some have said that it does not augur well for accountability and transparency. Uh, what's your take on that? How would you rationalize the doling out of physical cash to certain beneficiaries of the SIP? Well, I don't think it's... Uh, it's um, first of all, it's, um, it's, it's something that we would want to get over with as quickly as possible. We would want to see a digitization of the payment system, especially for conditional cash transfer. Uh, and we had, I think, uh, we had already started talking to so many mobile uh, money um, um, agents or agencies uh, to see how we'll be able to digitize it as much as possible and reduce uh, the propensity of having to take cash physically to local communities to be able to make payments. Uh, but that's what we are hoping to do. That's what we have started doing. We have started this discussion. The negotiations have started late last year. Uh, with uh, so many of these mobile agents. But now let's come to the reality of why this is happening. Um, the conditional cash transfer is targeting the poorest of the poor people. Mm -hmm. And the poorest of the poor people, you and I know that hardly have phone numbers. Without phone number, you cannot have a bank account in Nigeria. Um, and most of these banks go to places where there are thriving economic activities where they can have people actually go to the bank and have use of it. So you have a lot of people in remote areas who are in the ultra-poor category who do not have bank accounts, never been to bank, never had the money to put in a bank in the first place, don't have the minimum required balance of 500 naira or 200 naira that you're talking about. Those are the people that have been targeted to be given this conditional cash transfer. And they would have to travel maybe uh, to the next village or to the next most populous village around them to be able to get even a bank, uh, a physical bank structure or an ATM, uh, or an ATM machine, for example. So... We are left that we are left with a structure that we found that is not really conducive, but we have to start doing something about it because we needed to start giving out these monies to the poorest of the poor people. Meanwhile, while we go along, we also make plans to be able to digitize it because the more you get this money, five thousand naira every month, we hope that <clears throat> the next two, three years or four years, you'll be able to slowly pull yourself out of that lethargic stage of absolute poverty and be able to be. Uh, a bankable person. And we also teach them, you know, financial uh, literacy in terms of opening bank accounts, doing this and doing that. Uh, but that's also a, that was something, the gradual process. And we are also dealing in certain quarters of this country with people that simply do not even believe in banks. You know, <laughs> there are certain people that simply don't believe in banks. They don't believe in taking their monies into bank because they believe that banks use their money to to, uh, there's usury on it, you know, or there's uh, interest as well. Because so some people but, don't but believe in that. Let me come so what I'm saying is yes. that to just answer your s simple question, mm -hmm. it's something is a, a process that is ongoing. The digitization okay. issue uh, is a process that is ongoing. But for now, 
we are left with no choice than to pay the PSPs to go and pay physical cash because that's the only way the money will get to the people. I'll take that. I'll take that for now. There are a couple of questions coming in from some of our viewer, um, viewers out there and would like for you to take as many, as much as you can in the course of our conversation. So I'll just quickly and very, um, very quickly bring you the first question. Hello, my name is Magdalena Yoma from Cross River State. Um, my first question, what palliative measures is the federal government giving to SMEs whose incomes and those of their staff is adversely affected by the sudden lockdown? Secondly, um, it does appear the conditional cash transfer scheme is being shared without an updated database. How are the vulnerable clusters not captured previously um, going to be reached and through what strategy are they going to be identified and captured? And also, are civil societies and the traditional institution going to be involved in this process? The final question. Some schools of thought suggested the use of VVN to reach Nigerians affected by this lockdown. Is there a possibility of that mechanism being used? Thank you. It seemed like she just made allusion to the question that I just asked you mm -hmm, on BVN. Mm -hmm. So you could just leave that out and take our other questions since you've already answered that. Well, for the, uh, uh, she talked about what uh, other palliatives are there for the SMEs. Um, I do know that uh, the Minister of Finance, I, I heard her, her press conference that she did, I think, last week, uh, where she talked about the stimulus package that is coming on board. And I know that there was a question that was asked directly to her about, you know, small and medium and business owners and private enterprises. And she said that there's going to be like a round table where that can be discussed. Uh, so that's a question for the Ministry of Finance, uh, Budget and National Planning. Uh, it's something that they would have to see how much we have in our coffers, how much uh, we are able to dole out and get the necessary presidential approval for that, discuss it in the economic team, and, and talk about these are, these are serious economic uh, uh, discussions that need to take place. Because um, I totally agree that um, uh, the lockdown is not only affecting the people who are poor, but business owners as well, who are private business owners, who pay their workers, uh, are now affected because they can't go around doing their businesses because their business is affected, so other people have been affected as well. So I think the Ministry of Finance is in a better place to answer that question adequately uh, she, uh, yes, uh, she, in that regard. Yeah. Now, the, on the issue of um, civil, society involvement, uh, yeah. civil society involvement and the and the traditional institutions. Right now, in the conditional cash transfer, these people are already involved. The civil society are mostly involved in terms of observation to make sure they are observing what we are doing, and uh, both in terms of recruitment and the payment. Uh, that uh, a lot of civil society, I know I have an officer who is under my office, uh, who manages the M&E, who deals with the third party monitors. And I know that we've done a lot of trainings with them. They've given us a lot of support, both international NGOs and, uh, and local NGOs as well, and local uh, CSOs as well, that we have partnered to do that. And in every community that we go into, of course, we would have to discuss with the, with the traditional uh, ruler or traditional institution, traditional person, whoever is the highest traditional person there, um, the, uh, the imam or the pastor, or all the people, community leaders who are respected are part of the people that come and form the community-based team to sit down in the focus group discussions in raising, in defining what is poverty in that particular community. Because we have to be, uh, let's be, Let's be clear about, you know, what may be poverty in Lagos may mm. not be what would be poverty in Zamfara or in Kano or in Katsina. So every community defines its own poverty according to its own uh, statistics. And how did we go about getting these statistics in the first place? We got it from National Bureau of Statistics. It was not arbitrarily yeah, uh, raised. Yeah. The National Bureau of Statistics have data of the poorest of the poor communities around the, around the country. And those are the, those, that, that was our starting point. You know, so we had to start from there because this this uh, particular program we're doing it in conjunction with the World Bank. Uh, the World Bank have already done some sort of cash transfers in the past. Uh, they know you know they know the statistics they used uh, based on National Bureau of Statistics. So that's what we just build upon. Uh, I, knew, I know they started in about eight states, so we build upon. We are now in all the thirty six states, with the exception, I think, of Ogun. I can't remember which precisely is, uh, which state is precisely left out, but that is also ongoing process. And this National Social Register, mm. it's an ongoing process. It's not finite. It's not something that we have finished. Like I told you, uh, we needed to a starting point. You know, we came into office in 2015. We promised that we're going to uh, dollar discharge transfers to the poorest of the poor people. 
you know, and then in 2015, towards the end of 2015, we did not do the 2015 uh, budget because the 2015 budget was done by the previous administration before it left. Correct. So there was no way we could start doing anything. But by 2016, it was our own budget. We started implementing our own budget that we passed, you know, as a government. Once that started, we knew we had to move. But there were so many data that were missing. So we needed to start somewhere. So the obvious place to go to is another government institution that has been there for a while, which is National Bureau of Statistics. Because if we had said that we are going to sit down, discard everything that has been done before and start afresh, we probably still wouldn't have been paying by now. Uh, let me just butt in here and, and quickly ask you to take on the second question, because I, I think the second question has a lot to do with this current issue, with this issue you're raising now. Hello, my name is Patrick Okafo. I'm, I'm a practicing lawyer in the United Kingdom. I just needed some clarification regarding the um, conditional cash transfers, uh, uh, which is meant for the, the most vulnerable and the poorest in Nigeria. Uh, the first question is, is there a social register uh, already in existence in the 36 states and the federal capital territory? If there is, is the money going to be disbursed based on the register? Um, also, has the money been disbursed already? If it has, um, or has it covered all the states and the federal capital territory? If not, which states are left out for now, and what which states have already been covered? And uh, finally, uh, who compiled uh, the lists? That who compiled the register uh, in the states and the federal capital territory? Was this? Uh, an entirely federal government initiative. Was it a federal government uh, initiative in terms of the compilation of the social register, or was it the uh, states and the local governments who had that done? Um, these are the questions that I would like answered. Please, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. First of all, he asked, you know, whose initiative was this? This is, of course, the federal government initiative in conjunction with the World Bank, right? But in terms of raising the register in every community. It is a job that the state and the local government officials are all involved. First of all, the state gives us officials of state ministries that are relevant to that particular job. Either it means national planning or budget or whatever, then we come together. Then for every community we are going, the local government officials in that community are also part of the community-based teams because they, are the, they have the local knowledge of the communities we are going to. All we need to do is we come with the statistics of, this is the statistics of the poorest of the poor from the National Bureau of Statistics that have been gathered over several years, taking all indices into consideration. So we go to a community, we go to say a state like, say, Lagos, and then in Lagos, you know, the state government will have to set up a structure, a structure called SOCO, that's a state, um, a state cash transfer unit, you know. And then those people are the ones, they are state government officials, with local government officials where we need to go. We all put a team together, including us and CSOs who, observe, uh, who are in the observation team and members of the World Bank, you know. And then we go to a community, we go, we have a sit down. It's a town hall meeting, a proper town hall meeting with community leaders and community members. Then we separate them into focus groups of youth, women, the elderly and people with uh, physically challenged people. Mm -hmm. These are the focus groups. Then we say, define what is poverty. And then they define poverty based on that. And then who do you agree in this community is poor? They name them themselves. We don't. We don't know them. They name them themselves. There's, a, there's also a, a, a mechanism, a, a, you know, a, what do you call it? A, Disagreement mechanism, GRM or something they call it, you know, where if somebody has been stigmatized as a result of having a, a, a fetal squabble with, <laughs> with, uh, with somebody or somebody, a member of the family has been a Boko Haram member before and they're still they are poor but the community is ostracizing them. Uh, you know, they could go and complain that, look, we fall into this category of the poorest of the poor, but the community simply do not like us because one of our child has been killed as a Boko Haram mm -hmm. or... There could be a lot of examples of why people could stigmatize a certain family or a certain household. And they could, they could report. And once we go to their houses and take up all the assets they have, and they fall within the category, the test, the proximity test of ultra poverty, then there would be some of the people that would start collecting this uh, cash once the, the, the register is cleaned up here yeah, because all the yeah, registers... Because he actually did raise the issue of the register and wanted to know how... So the register does exist. Is, yes. 
and the register does exist. In the register states, exists in all the states, with the exception yes. of one state. I can't remember which one precisely at this point. I think maybe it's Ogun. I don't remember. I can't remember, but I'll find out. Um, but it's in existence in all the states. Uh, right now, the payments are already ongoing in all the states. You know, it's going on in FCT, Imo. I know the minister went to Imo. She went to Anambra. She went to Ebony. Uh It's going on in Lagos. It's going on in, the diff it's going on in different places, all the states. I'm sure you're aware of some insinuations made, as in which made the round sometime no last week or the, the week preceding the, the last mm -hmm. uh, about the palliatives being the conditional cash transfer mm. being paid out in certain states while certain other states were exempted. Nah, that's, that's hogwash. People would always want to find uh, something to say. The minister cannot be in all the places at one time. We cannot deploy media attention in all the states at one time. So she basically just went to observe the one in Abuja because that's the closest and we're under lockdown. And she went to Kuali. She observed that one. And that was what the one the media took. The one the media took. And so people started taking snippets of it, the ones that are happening in Katsina or in Kano, and they're saying, but when she went to, she went to Imo, when she went to, Imo, when she went to uh, Anambra, when she went to, I think, Ebonyo, Inugo, one of those places, you know, there was also media attention, but it was not, it didn't go viral because it defeated the, you know, the narrative that they wanted to create that this was one-sided. So, so, you know, if you want to find mischief anywhere, you can get mischief anywhere you uh, want. Ahmed, let me quickly um, step in here and ask you this. There was a question that I got um, last week, uh, also, also on the issue of the social investment program, but then not, um, not the palliatives now, not targeting the poor and very, and very vulnerable. Now, the, 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 the question actually centered on what palliatives target the middle, and the middle income earners now whose daily subsistence may have been stopped as a result of the um, restriction placed on movement by the federal government. Okay, so, so let's be very clear. It's very important that you make out, you, you brought out this point. Let's be very clear about certain things. And I, and I think there's a lot of misunderstanding and misconception going around. And very quickly too, because yes. we'll I would need for us to take a couple of other questions. Okay, the conditional cash transfer is not a COVID-19 palliative. Let's be very clear about that. With or without the COVID-19, these people would still have been paid regardless. Mm. The question actually does No, 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 let's be very clear because a mm. lot of people thought that the conditional cash transfer came into existence as a result of this COVID-19 lockdown. No, well, the question that we got, yes. that I got last week, was specifically centered on what palliatives target the middle income earner. Mm. Okay, great. Especially now that is our. But I answered that question of, earlier. Yes, I told you yes. that this uh, this is a question for Ministry of Finance or Ministry of Finance and okay. Budget and National Planning. Okay. That's what I'm saying. I, I said I, that's that's what I'm trying to explain. The social investment is an existing program. The directive the president gave us in his national broadcast on COVID nineteen was to say that instead of paying one one month Pick for the months. conditional cash transfer, put two months together and pay. And then for Instead of collecting and, and uh, requesting for loans to be paid back for the trader money, Mass give a moratorium for three months. For three months. Right? Is, children are at home in school. Uh, children are not in school anymore. They are at home. The ones that you are feeding, primary one to three, find a way to feed them, even though the schools were closed. Those were the directors of the president. So... Is that still in the, is, is that still in the offing? I mean, what modalities are being worked out? I, I, I think that? The, I think the ministry is talking to a lot of stakeholders, with state governors especially, to see how that can be worked out. I don't know. They have not. I don't know if they have reached any decision on that yet or not. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not really in that conversation yet. Uh, okay, we'll just. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that what I'm saying is that there are other stimulus package that mostly would come out from the Ministry of Finance okay. under the targeting directive of the, the president, targeting of all the, the strata yeah. of the population. population. But what I do know is that the Ministry of Agriculture has been ordered to release 70,000 tons of grains, and the customs have been ordered to release 150 trucks of rice. Now, that put together would be shared among all the states to people that need food and grains. Well, in terms of pecuniary stimulus directly 
targeting other strata that are not an ordinary existing beneficiaries of social investment. Yes, no. That yeah, is entirely yeah, within the purview of Ministry of Finance. Uh, let's very quickly take two questions um, in quick succession and you, you'd answer both questions afterward. Mm. The report by the NCDC had shown tremendous results about the treatment of COVID-19 cases. My question goes thus. What are these best practices or treatment structures to be implemented for this result? And then secondly, within a decade, two great viruses emerge. What are the futuristic plans to contain any other reoccurrence? Josephine Mudassir, New Jersey, USA. Uh, this is a core medical question. I, I don't know if you'd like to say anything, but we'll take our second question just before you react to that. Uh, my name is Richard Friday Noyo. You know, I'm the executive director of Sin Solution Network, and I'm speaking from Calabar. I would like to ask these two questions in respect to the federal government's national plan in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The first question I would like to ask, look at the fact that we've been confronted by this pandemic. What are the plans on ground by the federal government to ensure that we have the rights as a company in the future that can help us produce our medical equipment to enable us tackle as a future pandemic just in case if any happens in the future. Uh, the second question I would like to ask also is in respect to the cash payments being done as a few days ago by the federal government. I would like to ask what were the criteria used by the federal government to effect those payments as in two different households in Castina, Nasara and Exwell because as the executive director of, of uh, NGO across the state, I get loads of calls from people asking for support. So I'd like to know those criteria so that way in future we'll be able to sit together and see how we can actually make policy decisions in the area of criteria development. Thank you. You already spoke to some of these issues raised mm. by our... But just remind uh, me of the question of the first speaker, the first question. It, it was quite medical. She wanted to know what steps are being taken by, or, well, what steps will be taken by the federal government to curb or avoid the reoccurrence of what we have on ground right now. Well, I am like like you rightly pointed out, I'm not a medical expert. I'm not in the NCDC. I, I don't know what plans they are making. But what I do know off the cuff is that um, the easiest way to flatten this curve is the lockdown has proven to be the most effective see, yeah. means of stopping the spread of this virus. In addition uh, to you know, personal hygiene. Absolutely, and, and in addition to that. You know, so, sanitation so, so, so communal sanitation and so many other things which the government has been preaching from day one, social distancing has proven to be very effective around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's, that's what government will keep preaching and hoping that this thing doesn't, doesn't uh, before I let you go, testing keeps Before going. I let you go, Barrister Hamid, uh, the president just a couple of um, days ago said there will be more palliatives. More palliatives will be rolled out to mm -hmm. help mitigate the economic impact of um, the coronavirus pandemic mm -hmm. here in Nigeria. How quickly can we see that play out? Uh, I think as soon as government can, can get around to it. Uh, the, I know that the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs right now is uh, it's, uh, in, it's collaborating with customs uh, through the PTF to make sure that they distribute a lot of the grains going around. Um, and like I said, I'm sure the Minister of Finance would come up with something that would, uh, that would uh, you know, target the other status of the, com uh, of the community or the society as well. Uh, unfortunately, we, we can't take more questions. We're completely out of time. But we're going to work out a way to, um, uh, uh, maybe not um, maybe not centered on the COVID-19, but work out a way to bring you back to our studios here and um, see if it's possible to take on some of these questions that we've left out here today. Um, I want to thank you very much, mm -hmm. Barista um, Ahmed, for coming to our studio. We've been speaking with the senior special assistant to the president on the social investment program, um, Barrister Hadmet. It's been quite an enlightening um, moment, few moments for, for, for me here in the studio. I want okay. to believe that our viewer have been able to glean um, some insight from some of what you've said here. Uh, thank you so much for coming on okay. Insight. Okay. Up next is our interview segment. My next guest is part of a group currently leading the charge in Nigeria's fight against COVID-19. Dr. David Ajibade is the director, Brains and Body Foundation. Welcome to Insight. Thank you very much. Dr. Ajibade, give me a sense of um, perhaps the resounding thoughts in the minds of doctors, nurses, and other healthcare providers in the front line 
of this campaign against COVID-19. Uh, what do you think would be, or is rather, the resounding thoughts in their head? I know you're sworn to protect lives. Lives, I beg your pardon. I know you're also sworn to give care to patients, no matter what the symptoms are or whatever they're facing. But now, I, I also get a sense that doctors are facing perhaps the, one of the biggest fights in their career or careers. Yeah. What is the resounding thought in their head as they face this battle, this invisible enemy? Well, I, <laughs> a couple of things, really. Um, in some cases, conf they are conflicted because, of course, like you said, you have to, we're sworn to treat patients, no matter what the situation is. But at the same time, you have to think about uh, your health and, of course, that of your families. These are doctors who have families, who have loved ones, who they go back home to. Sometimes after a very, very hard, grueling day of work, and they mo most likely come in contact with COVID-19 patients, among other patients. How do we know which is which? Uh, some of those things, as we have seen, they, they, they present very much the same as a flu or even sometimes malaria or even diarrhea. So how, how do we know which is which? And so the doctors, being doctors, we have to treat. But at the same time, we have to be extremely cautious to, not to take anything back that will affect our families. So I, I think the number one word is conflict, confliction. Uh, 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 very well. I, I mean, I, I know... And I'm very, I'm quite sure uh, that part of what was seen would would naturally in, increase the anxiety level of the average medical doctor. I mean, a nurse or or the even the cleaner in an isolation center. Yeah. For one, how 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 do these class or strata, you know, balance their mental health in order to deliver the best services to patients uh, at this point, especially now. It's 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 tough. I got to tell you, Namdi, because um, like I said, I mean, we, 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 there is. Luckily, Nigeria hasn't been overrun. The hospitals in Nigeria have been overrun the way they've been run, overrun in Italy or the U.S., for example. But still, there's there's growing there are growing numbers of people who are coming, and again, you're not sure which is which. You know, and the for until recently, they didn't have any protective. Uh, personal protective equipment for the doctors and for the nurses. And so that was a, a sense of trepidation. I mean, it, gives, it gives one a, one a sense of trepidation. If I go too far, if I do everything I want to do for this patient, if I want to touch everywhere and examine everywhere, how am I, how am I not so sure this person is going to cough on me and give me COVID-19? So, uh, but luckily in the last couple of weeks, uh, the government has really stepped up. And uh, through the government hospitals and through the, uh, the businesses, they've been able to... Uh, to provide a lot of this equipment and of this care for people, but it's still there's still a lot to be done, as you can imagine. Uh, so you don't think there's enough consideration for for the protection of um, of healthcare providers, especially at the isolation centre? Is that what you're saying? Uh, not exactly. I, I'm, I'm still saying there's, there's still a lot a lot to be done because we don't at this point there might be enough, but we're still expecting quite a much larger numbers. And remember, the the testing doesn't cover everybody. It only covers those who are, you are suspecting of having the disease. I'll ask you this, Dr. Jubadi. Do you think we should stop at isolation centers? Uh, don't you think, or do you think, for, for some, some have said, look, that a patient who exhibits or shows um, symptoms doesn't go straight to the isolation center. Right. Most times, they, they go to the clinic, neighborhood clinics and hospitals around. Right. Do you think this protective, personal protective equipment should, should also be delivered or should also be introduced and used at such clinics and um, healthcare centers in the neighborhood? Ideally, it should, but it would be hard to, to supply all the centers and all the clinics with, uh, with uh, the, the protective equipment. Um, in fact, in some cases, they say... Ideally, is the government's responsibility to, to supply? Shouldn't hospitals be able to procure for themselves at this point? considering what we have on the ground? Ideally, yes. They should be able to, go to provide for themselves. But again, you have to remember, Nambi, this, everything, everything is being stretched at this moment. And again, you don't know who is who. It could just be a simple malaria. Yeah. So um, given every single person, every single healthcare professional, including the cleaners, uh, protective uh, care equipment, you would run out really quickly. And then if, God forbid, there's a surge in cases, you're left with... with uh, with a lack, a deficit. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balancing act. You, you have to accept, as a, as, a, um, as a hospital administrator, you have to uh, exercise a lot of judgments and be sure that you're doing the right thing in terms of 
rationing and using the equipment the way they should be used. So it's a tough one. Uh, I'm sure, I mean, you, you get a sense of what is happening now and doctors like yourself uh, in the front line of these current fight against um, COVID-19 would have seen how things are evolving, fast evolving with the COVID-19 making us reevaluate our priorities in terms of investment in the healthcare sector and in terms of improvements in the procurement of equipment. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we begin to sustain action? Well, it, it has happened. COVID-19 is making us fast track and upscale activities in, this, in that regard. Yeah. But how do we sustain action in the event that a similar virus, and we hope not, but in the event that in the near future or sometime in the future, uh, something somewhat of this sort uh, plays out again. How do we as a country sustain action to ensure that, look, we have our, our healthcare system is up to death, not with obsolete uh, equipment. And I mean, how do we do that so, so that we can be somewhere where we can uh, deliver sustainable healthcare service uh, to our people? And as a doctor, and I, I work with the, with, the, with the government myself, we have an MOU with what, what we do, but everybody recognizes that there are still things that have to be, uh, have to be put in place, not just... And, and I th I'm, I'm glad, again, in, in a way that, okay, now the bourgeois, so to speak, the, the creme de la creme, who normally would just go abroad for their treatment and their family's treatment, they, have, they, are, they are forced to stay in and really look at and, and, and see firsthand the state of health, not only of the public se sector, but also of the private sector hospitals. And they were able to see, and I'm sure a lot of good things will come out of this. And we're already seeing that coming from the, the oil industry, the oil and gas industry. They're beginning to supply not just hospital equipment now, but you look at um, generators, um, things that help to support the machinery of the hospital. So we're beginning to see some, uh, some changes, and I hope that that will be sustained over and beyond this COVID-19 period. Uh, Dr. Ajiba, there's no known cure for... COVID-19, uh, well, uh, as far as I know for now, uh, uh, yes, indeed, there are researches ongoing to find vaccine and cure for COVID-19. But we, we seem to have a relatively impressive recovery ratio <laughs> in yeah. Nigeria. Yes, yes, I mean, for sure. Uh, give us a sense or try uh, to put this in perspective for our viewer out there. How is that possible? I mean, countries like the U.S., countries like the U.K., uh, by no means having an, uh, easy, an easy time. Yeah, yeah but we I seem to have quite a relatively impressive recovery ratio. Yeah, how are we managing to to achieve that? How are doctors like yourself managing these patients and getting this laudable achievement? Well, a lot of credit goes to the government. And a lot of credit goes to our healthcare professionals on the front line. But I got to tell you, it's, it's still a surprise to me, too, that the numbers aren't a lot much worse than what they currently are. And some have given, put, some, put forth some theories that, okay, well, the heat, heat could be a factor. And maybe, maybe it is, too. Um, others have said, well, because of our, what is known as our microbiome, our um, innate ability our, in our, uh, the, the kind of bacterial viral mix that, are, that we've grown up with in our bodies. We've, there's something called about your in, immunity and how we've been faced with all kinds of tropical diseases and viruses in the past and maybe we've developed some kind of innate resistance being in Africa. It's not the same in the U.S., for instance, because the black Africans, they're finding out that black Americans are dying a lot faster exactly. than white Americans are. So it's not just about being black. Mm -hmm. It's about being growing up in this environment where you've been faced with tropical diseases like malaria, you've used chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine in the past, which is now being hailed as a wonder drug in the United States. So, the, uh, like I said, the microbiome, our gut bacteria, um, the heat could play, a factor, could play a role in it too. And there might be another factor too that is stemming this tide so to speak. I mean, I sometimes think about it. I'm like, when, like two weeks, three weeks, a month ago, we were like, oh my God, there's a tsunami coming to, is, if it's so bad in the US and other countries where they're so, the, the, health, the healthcare is so good, how will it be if it comes to Nigeria? And we're all scared that it's, it's going to wipe every half of the population out. It hasn't even come close to doing that. It's not but, even a fraction. Our button here, clinically, is it possible to take each symptom as they come and clinically isolate them and manage them? for a patient now. What do you mean by it, each symptom? I mean, I mean say if we, we, we know if you're symptomatic, yes. you would have um, cold, 
cough, sneezing, mm -hmm. um, fever. Uh, is it possible for the managing physician now to say, okay, I'll take this cold now, and then they manage the cold, and then they take the fever, and then they manage the fever? Is that perhaps an approach that is being deployed? Yes. No, so most COVID-19 cases here and abroad are treated symptomatically. Okay. Um, whether in the hospital or at home. Uh, just take uh, the anti uh, the anti uh, fever medications, the anti pain um, cough medications, and then watch. And if it now begins to get worse, and sometimes COVID nineteen could turn on the dime and become really really worse, then they they would have to step it up to take them to the hospital or, and possibly even to the ICU. Uh, but, and then of course, when it, when now it becomes more severe, that's really when you really need standard high quality medical equip equipment, especially the if it turns ventilator. ventilators. Yes. But here's the thing, Namdi, uh, we haven't heard many cases of people in respiratory distress to the point where they need a ventilator. And that's true. Um, so even some people are saying the testings, well, they're not testing everybody. Well, sure, but the hospitals would have been started indicating it at this point if we were having a large number of people suffering the severe forms of COVID-19. Now, who knows? A large percent of the population may actually be have, have had or contracted the virus and it just had a mild, maybe a cough, a fever, and that has passed, it was transient. And so they've, they've moved on. But again, it could be those factors we just mentioned that are keeping them from, keeping it from developing to something more severe. And we know that anybody who has the virus, who contracts the virus, 80% will just have a mild case. It's only 20% that will now need expert hospital care. Uh, talking about the safety of um, doctors, nurses, and other healthcare providers in the front line, um, I, I, well, it's quite possible, and we've seen that play out in some places, in some countries. Um, I don't know if it, if it has already played out. Yeah, where doctors and healthcare givers become agents of transmission of the virus themselves. Is there perhaps a modality, and please, again, help us put this in perspective. Mm. What should be the modality to stop or curb um, doctors who, even though they, 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 they wear the protective, that's the PPE, mm -hmm. each time they go into the isolation centers to attend to patients, how can we stop them from being agents of transmission themselves? Well, the obvious one is that we have to test doctors every single day and doctors, nurses, and cleaners who come in contact with patients to see if they've contracted the, the virus. So that has to be in place. Okay. So that we know that when they're not coming into this pool and taking anything back with them and then transmitting it to other patients or transmitting it to people outside the hospital. So that needs to be taken care of. Um, in terms of uh, ensuring that they use the, the PPEs like they should, okay. that has to be emphasized. Uh, emphasized is there like a forced. modality for that, for how to done and remove? Yes, there is. Uh, can you explain that to us? Uh, well, for instance, okay, you, you need the whole hand washing technique. There, there's a way in which we have to wash your hands and the back of your hands and all that. You have to put your gloves on. There's a way you put your gloves on. And of course, if, you're in, if you are actually in the ICU, the gowns, there's a procedure by which you put the gowns on and there's a procedure by which you take them off. Because if you don't take them up properly, you might just uh, spread a lot of germs out in the, in, in, the, in the public spaces. Okay. We're at a level right now where a transmission is getting to the community level. So it's called the uh, community spread level. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we balance surveillance? That's in terms of contact tracing now and the economic realities on ground. Yes, we have to achieve this, mm -hmm. but we have to also put that against this. Yeah. I mean, if you get my drift. It's tough. It's really tough. One of the good things that this lockdown has done is that it has allowed the agents of the NCDC, agents of the Federal Ministry of Health and volunteers to actually go out into the communities, especially in Lagos, to actually test and trace those who they suspect may have been affected. For instance, in Lagos, if they didn't have this lockdown in place, they simply would not be able to move around as effectively as they should because of the traffic and movement and all that. So uh, it's, it's to be commended that that step was taken. Now, how that affects in terms of our people, I mean, we don't have all this access to places like Walmart and Spa and all these uh, big, big food companies that have processed food. And then you take the processed foods, we can last like two, three weeks, four weeks, sometimes even without a fridge. Most of us have to go to the market and buy our foods fresh and cook them. And, and so after a week or so, we have to go to the market. And that's why the government had to open up the markets to some degree. Now, that, does that, will that affect yeah. the transmission again? And will that cause new cases to come up? Who knows? It might. 
but there's there's got to be like you said there's got to be that balance in in which you are dealing with the health needs but also not neglecting the most the um, economic reality that is on ground so uh, it's okay. tough uh, let's take the people and you're the expert here uh, let's take the people through what and what they should do or can do in in order to have not just the government but also have themselves stay away from contracting the, the virus. Uh, I mean, in terms of personal hygiene now, we'll, we've talked about the washing of hands, the sanitizer. use of um, alcohol-based sanitizer. Uh, please just take us through that, uh, especially for our viewer. It's, it's just an affirmation of what we've been saying and uh, medical personnel like yourself have said time and time again. Well, the most important thing is that you want to keep the virus from getting into your lungs. That's or into your upper respiratory tract, uh, um, upper respiratory system first. So the sinuses, the nostrils, the mouth, the back of the mouth and the nose, and then down into the windpipe. That is what your protection should be, right? So that's why the masks are there, because you might inhale droplets. That's why um, they say you should sanitize your hands as much as possible. Not because the virus can enter through your hands. It can't. But because you can touch your eyes, you can touch your nose, you can touch your mouth. And from there, the virus can be washed or can get into your respiratory tract. And that's where we have to protect. If it goes into your stomach, as far as COVID-19 is concerned, it's not a problem. It seems, it seems to be destroyed by the stomach acids. So therefore, as they say, you've got to wash your hands thoroughly with soap because soap seems to destroy the viral layer and the virus itself. You sanitize you mentioned alcohol-based um, sanitizer. That is very important because that's what helps to kill the virus. It doesn't mean that when you drink alcohol, it's going to kill the virus. <laughs> <laughs> it, it makes it worse because taking a lot of alcohol will depress your immune system. And I can get to that in a minute. Um, and, of course, the social distancing. The thing about talking, and they now know that even as we're speaking now, they say if you speak loudly enough, the droplets can actually project. If you shout, droplets can project even further. And so, therefore, it's important that people keep maintain that social distance, don't crowd. It's, it may not be the easiest thing, especially in the rural areas and, and uh, the really built-up areas, but it's still important that people be aware. I think that's the most important thing. People be aware of these things. Now, over and above, above that, I always talk about boosting the immune system, about strengthening the immune system. And there are some simple things that you can do, you can do about that. I've, I've mentioned over and over again, every black person needs vitamin D, where most of us are deficient in vitamin D. Vitamin D is extremely important for the immune system. System. So is vitamin C. So is magnesium. So is zinc. We're finding out that zinc, the reason why hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine are so effective, they're finding out, is because they open the channel for the zinc to enter into the virus and destroy the virus. It's zinc that is the, that is the active ingredient. What the hydroxychloroquine does, again, is that it opens the pathways for the zinc to enter and do its work. So zinc is really, really important for the immune system. Of course, not everybody can buy the supplements and all that, although that would be my number one recommendation. The, other, the thing is that we can get these this foods, fr fresh vegetables. Yeah. Not fruits per se, but vegetables more than anything, anything, uh, more than anything else. And of course, drinking lots of fluids can help because we know that moisture, especially in the respiratory tract, uh, it's, 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 it, it's, it, it limits the spread of the virus or it limits the activity of the virus. Uh, these are just steps to just boost one's immune system, like you said. They're not, yeah. they not like cure for the virus itself. Of course not. Of course not. And, and we say that. But here's the thing, Namdi. If you are doing all these things, the external, the washing of the hands and social distancing and boosting the immune system, if you do get the virus, God forbid, but if you do get the virus, you, you stand a much better chance of being the 80% okay. than in the 20%. Uh, Dr. Ajibade, just before I let you go, and very quickly too, yes. uh, is it possible that doctors and health institutions like your average clinic and hospitals in your neighborhood can begin to give in to the pressure of admitting patients who show similar symptoms, similar symptoms to COVID-19? I don't know if, but we have gotten unconfirmed reports that that has already uh, began to play out. You mean them admitting? Sim uh, refusing to admit patients showing similar symptoms to, to COVID-19. Is it possible that hospitals can begin to give in to pressure to refuse admitting patients who show similar symptoms to COVID-19? It's unfortunate, but there is a possibility. I mean, certainly not defending it at, uh, at all. It's possible that, well, yeah, I've heard some of those stories myself too. Um, in, in, especially in the most severe cases, it's very important that people go to areas where they're, where, where they are, their isolation centers. You must, your first priority is to take them to an isolation center where they can be treated. Because if you take them to a place where they, like a clinic that doesn't have the yeah. capacity to do yeah. that, 
you may not be able to get it. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I'll, I'll quickly say this. We also do know that the Nigerian Center for Disease Control has put out um, several platforms where its messages um, can easily reach the people for people or persons showing these symptoms to call some numbers and then um, such patients would be quickly picked up by NCDC to, to be tested. And of course, if confirmed positive, would be taken such a person would be taken to an isolation um, center for management and treatment. Well, on this note, Dr. David Ajibade, I want to thank you for coming on Insight. It's been an enlightening uh, moment here yeah, with you on set. I want to hope that you would come back here when next we invite you to come on Insight. Thank you so much for coming on the program, My Dr. Pleasure. David Ajibade is the executive is the director. I beg your pardon of Brains, Brains and Body Foundation. Um, based there in Abuja. Up next is the media review segment with Elizabeth Amori. Thanks for joining us on the media review segment of the program. Today we shall be talking about fake news. Now that the nations of the world is grappling with a common enemy, COVID-19. And for Nigeria, how would Nigeria handle this at this time? My guest, Mitairi Ikme of the NCA, who has been following up on the PTF's briefings, will provide answers. It's nice to have you in the studio again. Many thanks, Lizzie. Thanks for having me. All right, let's just go straight to the point. Rumors have it that one billion naira has been spent on SMS. How true is this? Okay, thank you. The Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 at uh, its daily briefings was quick to uh, discredit that rumor, as it were. Um, the Director General of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, NCDC, made it very clear that the bulk SMS uh, messages which it is sending out to inform Nigerians about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic they are actually sponsored by the private private sector, okay. and so it has not actually spent uh, one billion naira for the provision of information or the dissemination of information to Nigerians on COVID-19, and uh, so that's for that. And again, with respect to other uh, fake news that were in the rumor mill. Some people sat in the comfort of their homes and came out with um, figures. The figures that uh, the presidential task force was collecting uh, some monies to the tune of hundreds of thousands as uh, daily allowances. Uh, both the chairman of the task force, uh, Mr. Boss Mustafa, who is the secretary to the government of the federation, and the minister of information and culture, Mr. Alajilai Mohammed, they were quick to also discredit that notion and they said no member of the presidential task force is receiving any daily al allowance that oh. in fact according to him that that's the minister of information and culture that they were even spending their own resources when uh, occasion when necessary uh, ne when occasion arise okay just recently a report came out that ncdc says 80 percent of the calls coming to the connect the, its connect center is actually hoax how true is that well uh the what the presidential tax force on covid 19 said with uh, respect to hoax or hoax calls is that the it would be wrong for anybody at this point in time to think that the pandemic itself is a hoax mm. it would not be right. In fact, it will be defeating all the efforts and all the measures being put in place in place by the government to ensure that Nigeria defeats the pandemic and that's wiped out of the nation. So um, that is not true, and that is also left for the NCDC to clarify. Okay. Figures are increasing. Cases are coming in. What is it? PTF doing about this? Government have been, has been putting in place measures to contain the spread and we keep having recording cases. Why? Yeah, the presidential task force basically believes on uh, 
the measures of testing, measures of contact tracing and uh, containment. And um, that was why um, in the course of daily briefings, the chairman of the task force and other members of the task force, task force actually appealed to state governments to work in consonance with the federal government because the restrictions are actually to contain the spread of the virus. And if you have some state governments that are relaxing the restriction orders, Order. like uh, like we had cases in Rivers, in Bayosa, in Ondo, you know, and even in uh, even in Katsina, you know, if you have cases of state government re relaxing relaxing the order, it will tend to defeat the purpose of government in trying to contain the pandemic. And that was why the presidential task force appealed for more time. No, they appealed for uh, cooperation on the part of the state government so that both the federal and state governments do not work at uh, cross purpose, especially as, as it has to do with uh, containing the, the virus. And if you ask me, even the Ondo state government took a cue from that and uh, initially when they said that they were going to relax the, or, or uh, lift the suspension for religious gathering, they had to reverse that decision. Okay. Well, I would like to ask you personally, relaxing the order, is this the way out? Because we keep having figures coming up, the numbers are increasing virtually on a daily basis. Relaxing the order is certainly not the way out, because okay. if we relax the restriction order, then um, the NCDC has, has already said that there are indications that we are beginning to have community transmission. So if we relax the restriction order, you can be sure that you never can tell who will go to where when the crowds meet at uh, different uh, public places. So it would definitely not be in our best interest. And there are already projections that if we extend the lockdown, this is what we are likely going to have. And if we relax it, this is what we are likely going to have. Going by what is happening across the globe uh, over the uh, weekend or in the past few days, we had the United States of America recording more than 2,000 deaths in a single day. Mm -hmm. Nigeria certainly does not want to go that route. We don't want to experience that. So it will not be in our best interest to relax uh, the order, the restriction orders at this time. And the uh, presidential task force, members of the task force, have already met with uh, the president as they, and they have briefed the president on the assessment of the impact of the lockdown so far. And uh, in fact, I'm sure as we speak, uh, decisions have been taken concerning um, extending the lockdown. Okay. Um, I could remember vividly in one of the briefings you asked the Minister of Information what the government would be doing to cop fake news. Could you brief us on that? Yeah, basically I asked that and uh, what more can the government do other than to be ahead of uh, the purviors of fake news? Okay. And that is by giving out the correct information real time, especially regarding issues. Um, th those who those who ban, uh, those who spread fake news rely on lacuna in information. Okay. And when there's a lacuna, then it will seem as if anything that is in the public space is uh, believable. But when these fake news are countered by the government or when the government provides specific information on issues, then you can be sure that uh, people will look up to the right sources for authentic news and fake news will not thrive. Okay. You know, everybody, uh, let's let's say 80% of Nigerians, we all have phones. We use our phones. What do you have to say to people that just take pictures or just send messages or people share things with them and then they keep passing? It keeps moving, moving, and then it spreads. What do you have to say to them now that we are fighting fake news and then COVID-19? I think Nigerians have a great role to play in um, vetting or uh, authenticating what they pass across, what they receive and what okay. they pass across at this time. I use myself as, a, as an example. When I see um, an information or I see a video or something, I look at it, I, look, uh, I try to ascertain the veracity and the authenticity and I refrain from spreading, especially if, if I know that 
it may not be true or it is not authentic. And I think that's one thing Nigerians can help themselves to do and help the government to do at this time, to um, try to authenticate something. You can place calls, you can call... Ask questions. Uh, you can ask questions, you can call uh, your journalists, you can call your friends in the media, you can verify from uh, authentic sources before you just start uh, sharing. sending or sharing and broadcasting uh, such news items that in, at the end of the day may do the society more harm than good. Dang good. All right, Ms. Harik, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for coming again to Thanks. enlighten us. Thanks for thank having me. Thank you very me. much. Don't forget, don't just share. Let's fight fake news and COVID-19 together. This is where we wrap things up today for this episode of the program. Elizabeth? Well, it's very simple. Don't share fake news. Indeed, don't share fake news. And do stay tuned to NTA, where we bring you all of the facts. Until we'll see you next week, Namdi Adibo is my name. And I'm Elizabeth Omori.